Hello, my name is Peter Pressman. I'm an assistant professor of behavioral neurology at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus, and today I'm going to be giving an introduction to frontotemporal degeneration and its subtypes. We'll begin with a general introduction of frontotemporal degeneration, or FTD, and then dive deeper into the terminology and the history so that we understand where these sometimes confusing terms can come from. We'll then discuss each of the major subtypes of frontotemporal dementia, including the behavioral variant, or BVFTD, and the two subtypes that are also forms of primary progressive aphasia, the non-fluent variant of primary progressive aphasia, or PPA, and the semantic variant of PPA. We'll also discuss some of the genetics that can underlie FTD and end by discussing resources that are available to help people with FTD and their families. FTD is one of the most common causes of young onset neurodegenerative dementia with an average age of onset between 45 to 65 years of age. Though people younger and older than that age range can also get the disease. FTD impacts around 60,000 people in the United States. Diagnosis is frequently slow. There is often years of misdiagnosis before an accurate diagnosis of FTD is provided. I don't think that any dementia is easy for patients or families. However, the frontotemporal degenerations can present patients and families with some really unique challenges. Some of these costs are hard to measure, such as the emotional and social costs that can come from watching a loved one's personality change. There are also more measurable costs such as direct costs of medical care and indirect costs due to loss of someone's job or legal costs, marital counseling, or financial consequences of poor judgments, which are sometimes part of frontotemporal degeneration. All in all, the financial costs of frontotemporal degeneration can be upward of twice that of a normal course of Alzheimer's disease. The terminology surrounding FTD can be confusing. The term covers at least three major subtypes and has also gone by the name PIX disease, frontotemporal dementia, and frontotemporal lobar degeneration, among some others. There are three main subtypes of frontotemporal degeneration. The behavioral variant is the most common, and there are two other subtypes which are considered to be classes of primary progressive aphasia, that is the non-fluent and semantic variants of primary progressive aphasia are also considered to be subtypes of frontotemporal degeneration. Just to add to the mix, frontotemporal degeneration can also come with other diseases like amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or ALS, sometimes called Lou Gehrig's disease. It may also go along with certain movement disorders like corticobasal syndrome or progressive supranuclear palsy. About half of the cases of frontotemporal degeneration are the behavioral variant of FTD. In the behavioral variant, or BVFTD, people experience some pronounced shifts in their previous personality. This can include early disinhibition, acting without thinking things through, impulse buying, for example, spending a lot of money on a car. It may involve apathy, a loss of interest in doing the things that someone previously enjoyed, it may include a early loss of empathy. Somebody who was previously warm and caring may suddenly be distant and cold. People may develop stereotyped or ritualistic behavior. 
This can run from repetitive tapping or something like that to more elaborate, somewhat religious behaviors. People can develop changes in appetite with strong preferences for just one type of food, such as sweets. They may also develop hyperorality, shoving things in their mouth that aren't even food. And they may develop executive dysfunction, meaning problems with attention and organization. If someone has three out of six of these constellation of symptoms, we say that they meet criteria for possible BVFTD. To meet criteria for probable BVFTD, we like to have some imaging such as an MRI scan or PET scan that shows a disproportionate problem in the frontal and temporal lobes. You can also have a definite diagnosis of BVFTD. This usually takes some sort of autopsy or biopsy, which we almost never do, or it can be a situation in which somebody has a known genetic mutation that can cause frontotemporal degeneration. In addition to BVFTD, two of the subtypes of frontotemporal degeneration are considered subtypes of primary progressive aphasia, or PPA, as well. PPA means a problem with language, which is progressively worsening over time. One of these is the non-fluent or agrammatic variant of PPA. In this subtype of frontotemporal degeneration, people really struggle to get words out. They have a hard time forming words with their mouth, and the result can sound like a kind of garbled or strangled attempt to speak. In addition, they also have problems understanding grammatically complex sentences in addition to saying anything that is grammatically complex. Another subtype of frontotemporal dementia, which is also a primary progressive aphasia, is the semantic variant, or SVPPA. In this variant, people may be able to speak clearly, but they have a hard time recognizing sometimes even very simple, previously familiar words, and they can have a hard time coming up with the names for things as well that they used to know very well. As the disease progresses, they may begin to struggle to remember other things about commonly used or encountered objects. For example, someone that I just saw recently confused the purpose of a toothbrush and that of a hairbrush, trying to brush their hair with a toothbrush instead. There's a third type of primary progressive aphasia, the logopenic variant, in which people just struggle to come up with words and may also have a hard time with repeating things, particularly if a sentence is long or complicated. This, however, is most commonly due to underlying Alzheimer's disease pathology. As I mentioned, frontotemporal degeneration sometimes goes along with other neurodegenerative diseases. For example, sometimes people with FTD can show motor symptoms along the lines of ALS, or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, sometimes called Lou Gehrig's. ALS is a neuromuscular disorder, meaning that it causes weakness. Around 50% of people with ALS show changes in language or behavior reminiscent of FTD, and sometimes this goes on to frank frontotemporal degeneration. And about 30% of people with frontotemporal degeneration can show motor symptoms along the lines of ALS. There are also movement disorders like progressive supranuclear palsy or corticobasal syndrome, which may look a little bit like Parkinson's disease. But in this case, it may also 
go alongside frontotemporal lobar degeneration, or FTD. Unfortunately, the process of establishing a diagnosis of FTD can be frustrating for patients and families. It is frequently misdiagnosed as, for example, a primarily psychiatric disorder like depression. Getting an accurate FTD diagnosis can take upwards of three and a half years and sometimes more. In order to establish the diagnosis, it's important to work with people who are familiar with the disease. These people will take a very detailed history to understand the symptoms and will also perform a detailed neurological evaluation. In addition to some standard blood tests, which can be ordered to rule out more treatable causes of cognitive or behavioral changes, the treating physician may also order a brain scan. This can be an MRI or a PET scan, for example. Above, you can see an MRI of somebody with FTD. Near the top of the screen on the far left, you can see where the frontal lobes have atrophied or shrunk. In the middle, you can see as if someone is looking straight on, and a side view on the right, again showing the shrunken frontal lobes. The scans on the bottom are a PET scan, all as if you were looking down from the top of the head. In blue, you can see an area of less brain activity. This again can be a sign of frontotemporal degeneration. As awareness has grown about frontotemporal dementia, particularly the behavioral variant, we have also had to learn ways of seeing when something is not BVFTD and when we might want to suggest other forms of treatment. There is an entity, for example, now known as the BVFTD phenocopy, which sometimes is BVFTD and sometimes is not. In phenocopy, there is very little sign of a shrunken brain on neuroimaging, and there is sometimes questionable, if any, disease progression. We become more concerned about other disorders, such as primary psychiatric disorder, if there is a long history of mood or personality disorders. Other signs that this may not be BBFTD would be if someone is feeling self-blaming or expressing guilt about their behaviors, or if their primary concern is about anger. Sometimes we can see these things in BVFTD, but we begin to be a little suspicious about other alternatives if we find that these are present. People with FTD are often not as interested in pursuing or learning more about the disease, as apathy or lack of caring or engagement is so common. Also, People with BVFTD usually don't have the social grace to act normal in one environment, but let loose and be disinhibited or ignore social customs in another situation. All of these things, though, are more guidelines than absolute rules, as BVFTD is a very mixed disorder and can sometimes present in unexpected ways. This is a complicated slide, but I'm mostly showing it to demonstrate a complicated problem. This is work done by Dr. David Perry at University of California, San Francisco, where they evaluated the brains of many people with the behavioral variant of frontotemporal dementia after death. When somebody presents to us with the classic, slowly progressive memory problems when they're over the age of 65, 
we can say, okay, this is probably Alzheimer's disease. And if I were to look at the brain under a microscope, I would see beta amyloid plaques and tangles of tau. This is much harder to predict in BVFTD. If I were to look at the brain under a microscope in BVFTD, sometimes I would see PICS, cortical basal degeneration, PSP, or other tangles or problems with tap. Sometimes I would see another class of misfolded protein altogether called a TDP43. And sometimes I'd see other things like FUS protein, and sometimes, in fact, an unusual presentation of Alzheimer's disease. The fact that it is so challenging to predict what is going on in the brain when someone comes to us with the behavioral variant of frontotemporal dementia has been one of the major hurdles to overcome in developing a treatment since we don't actually know what the protein problem in the brain is. This is a little bit easier to predict in some of the forms of primary progressive aphasia, such as the semantic variant, but it's still not exactly 100%. We are better able to predict what is happening in the brain of somebody with frontotemporal degeneration when that person has the disease due to a genetic mutation. About 40% of people with FTD have some family history of dementia, neurodegenerative disease, or movement disorder, and around 15 to some say as high as 30% have a single gene inherited in what we call an autosomal dominant fashion, meaning that we can recognize someone with the disease in every generation. There are three main genes that are known to cause FTD, but there are many other less common genes as well. The mapped gene is associated with misfolded tau protein. Granulin and C9 ORF72 are associated with misfolded TDP43 protein. Of these, C9 ORF72 is the most common, making up somewhere around half of all people with a single genetic mutation causing their FTD. It's important to remember, however, that most FTD remains sporadic without a clear mutation as the cause. It's unfortunately true that there is no cure for FTD. However, that doesn't mean that there isn't help that's available. There are therapies such as occupational, physical, and speech therapy, which can help improve people's quality of life. There are treatments, sometimes using medicine, sometimes not, the latter non-pharmacological, to also help with certain symptoms. And there are resources to help support care partners and some people who are more aware of the symptoms with FTD. Furthermore, there are always opportunities for research to help be part of the movement to combat FTD. To learn more about frontotemporal dementia, what resources may be available to help patients and their families, and to help join the fight against frontotemporal degeneration, please visit the AFTD.org, check out the rest of the conference from May 13th to 14th, and you can always also contact the AFTD's helpline at info at the AFTD.org. We hope that you find all of these resources helpful and informative. And thank you again for listening.